And inshallah today, bi al kareem we'll start to actually speak about the verses within the surah. So of course we have to begin with the basmalah, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. You hear this phrase, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, being referred to as al basmala. Al basmala. Right? Al basmala, this word in the Arabic language, there's something called an nahd. An nahd. An nahd is when the Arabs take a few words, they take a phrase, and they comprise it into one word to refer to that phrase. So for Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, they say Al Basmala. For Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, it's referred to as Alhamdala. For La ilaha illallah, that's referred to as Al Haylala. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah is known as Al Hawqala. Okay? This is called An Nahd. Noon ha and ta, An Nahd. Right? It's kind of like an acronym in the English language or an abbreviation. So Al Basmala, when we say Al Basmala or when you hear the word Al Basmala, this is referring to Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And when we talk about the basmala, when we talk about Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we talk about the components that make up the basmala. So the very first thing which makes up the basmala is the ba, the letter ba, the b. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. That's the first part. And the scholars of Islam, and especially the scholars of the Arabic language, they talk about this ba. And for those of you maybe who are not so uh, familiar with the Arabic language. These letters, whether it's the ba or these particles of speech such as fi, ala, ila, these things, these letters have meanings. These prepositions have great meanings. And depending on the context of how they're used, the meaning reflects that. So the scholar said, what does this ba mean? When you say bismillah, right, obviously the translation is in the name of Allah. Right. So what they say is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The ba here is as you are about to embark on this action, you are asking for the baraka and the help of the name of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You are seeking blessings through the name of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in this action which you are about to embark upon. And that brings us to another point, which is if you really think about it, when you say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. That sentence itself, or those words itself, is something which is, quote-unquote, incomplete. There's something here in the Arabic language which is known as al-hadf, omittance, something being dropped, something not verbally being expressed, but being understood. In English also, it's known as subtext. It's there between the lines, but it isn't, uh, it, it isn't uttered. Because when you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, right, I say Bismillah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim before I recite Quran, and someone before they eat, they say Bismillah, and before they do any other thing, seeking the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say Bismillah, and Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And the secret behind that is that this phrase, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, can be used in all scenarios. Because the subtext was understood is understood through the action you're about to embark upon. So before you recite Qur'an, when you sit down and you say, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, what you're really saying is, أَقْرَأُ Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. I embark upon my recitation, seeking the help and assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you say, Bismillah, before you eat, you're saying, أَكُلُوا, I eat, Bismillah, I eat in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? When you say Bismillah before you make wudu, you're saying, Atawadda'u Bismillah. I perform wudu, I embark upon performing wudu, seeking the assistance and help through the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something you have to keep in mind before you say the Basmala, right? Before you eat, before you recite Quran, before you do whatever you're about to do, in which you're saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, this is in reality what you're saying. You're saying, I begin to write. For example, an author. You see at the beginning of Islamic books, you see at the beginning that the author writes, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Meaning, or I write, I author 
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Does that make sense, guys? The next point, Bismillahi. In the name of Allah, Bismillahi. The ulama explained that when you say Bismillahi in the name of Allah, in reality, when you're saying that, you're referring to all of the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you say Bismillahi in the name of Allah, you are referring to all of the names, all of the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they say in Arabic that when you have a mufrad, right? I know some of this might be a bit foreign to you all, but inshallah, it'll be beneficial. When you have a singular word in the Arabic language and it's connected to a word following it, which is known as mudaf and mudaf ilayhi in the Arabic language. Mudaf and mudaf ilayhi. When a mufrad, a single word, a singular word, is put in this situation, mudaf, mudaf ilayhi, to feed al-umum, or ta'um. Now this is something which means generality. It's unspecific. It's general. And an example of this in the Quran is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, وَإِن نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ But the translation says, and if you were to count the favors, which is plural, or the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would not be able to enumerate them. But in Arabic it says, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةً Which is one blessing or one favor. But here because of the word ni'mah being mudaf, right, ni'mata اللَّهِ Here it refers to all and every uh, blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of the different blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you say Bismillahi, you are now invoking all of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillahi. And Allah, as we know, that is the name of our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is his name, Allah. And when you say Allah also, this also refers to all of his different names, which he has told us in the Quran and which we know about. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى And to Allah belongs the beautiful names. The most beautiful of names. Bismillahi. And then here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this statement, in the Basmala, after we just said that when we say Bismillah, this refers to all of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody with me? But yet and still we see that two special names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are singled out. So when we say Bismillahi, this is referring to all of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yet and still after that we see Allah highlights two of his beautiful names. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. And the scholars explain this to mean that brothers and sisters, whenever you say the Basmala, whenever you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, you are constantly reminded of the vast mercy of your Creator. And that throughout the day, whenever you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, you are reminded that this worship which you are about to embark upon is worship for your Creator, your Lord, who is the most gracious, the most merciful. So you are, you are worshiping the one who is Ar-Rahman, the most merciful. Ar-Rahim, the most compassionate. So this should give you hope and motivation that I'm worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most gracious, the most merciful. So I know time and time again, if I fall short in my ibadah or if I fall short when it comes to my sins and the mistakes that I make, I'm worshiping Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Right, so this is something that you constantly remember and you constantly are reminded of whenever you say the basmala. And it's important for us brothers and sisters, respected elders, to always remember this great attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is ar-rahma, mercy. Because if we forget the mercy, in Allah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if shaitan begins to whisper to us and we start to despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then surely we have no chance of salvation. If a Muslim starts to despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, starts to forget that yes, I made a sin, I committed a sin, but my worship and my servitude is to 
Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the most gracious and the most merciful. This will constantly give a person hope, constantly allow a person to come back time and time again. Because just as we're, we will continue to sin, as long as we're alive, right? As we know, the Prophet Sallallahu is quoted to have said in the hadith, all of the sons and daughters of Adam are sinners. As long as you're alive, as long as you're breathing, there's always that chance, there's always, you know, that possibility of you committing a sin. And as human beings, we're prone to error. We're prone to sin. But we constantly remember, we remind ourselves that our Lord, our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman in Ar-Rahim. So we see, subhanAllah, the greatness of these two names. How great these two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are. And to speak specifically about Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, there's many things that the ulama have said about these two names and the difference between the two names. But generally speaking, they say Ar-Rahman refers to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. That He is merciful. That He has the attribute and characteristic of mercy. Ar-Rahman. And Ar-Rahim refers to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy reaches His creation. Okay? So the first one, the first name Ar-Rahman, generally speaking, refers to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the attribute of mercy. And that Ar-Rahim refers to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy reaches and touches His creation. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, all of these meanings are involved in this statement. All of these meanings are, revo- are involved in this verse. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. After that we have Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Alhamd, as many of you know, was translated to mean praise in English. Alhamdulillah. Praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this word Alhamd, It's far deeper than praise. It means much more than this word or this one single translation, which is the word praise. Because first of all, alhamd, this lamb here, al, al, to feed al-istighraq. That it's not just one praise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving of all and every praise. Jami' al-Muhammad. All praises are due and deserving to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here when you say alhamdulillah, the lamb here, alhamdulillah, al-ulama yaqulun, hadhi lamb, to feed al-ikhtisas. The all perfect praise is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who is praised perfectly. He is the only one who deserves perfect praise. And that human beings who are praised, human beings who are praised by one another, they're praised for something they did. They're praised for a juz, for a part of what they've done or a part of themselves, a part of their character, a part of how they are. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is praiseworthy from all angles, in all aspects. Alhamdulillah. And at this point, the scholars discuss the difference between the word hamd in the Arabic language and the word shukr. Right? Sometimes you hear people when they're praying, when they come back from ruku', they say, Sami'allahu liman hamida, Rabbana wa laka alhamd wa shukr. Right? And although the person, when they're saying this, they mean right and they mean well. But we have to ask ourselves, was this something that was said by the Prophet ﷺ in the prayer? Right? Was this something, was shukr adding this? Right? No one is debating, no one is going to tell someone, Akhi, you have evil intentions when you're doing this. We're not going to doubt the intentions of that person. Right? They mean well when they're saying that. They maybe were taught to say that when they come up from ruku'ah. But in reality, if we look at Sifatul Salat al Nabi, we look at the prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was very particular and very specific about the words that should be said in the prayer. Because if I bring something from my pocket, even if it's something good or has a nice meaning, and the brother brings something else from his pocket, and someone else brings something else from his pocket, and next thing you know, the prayer is looking different. The prayer starts to change. 
It's no longer what the Prophet Sallallahu used to say. So back to the point, what's the difference between Alhamd and Al-Shukr in the Arabic language or pertaining to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? They say that Alhamd is something which, is, which stems from the heart but is only professed on the tongue. You don't do hamd with your actions. Okay? If you want to loosely translate the word hamd as praise, that's fine. But we're going to try our best to stay and continue using the Arabic words just so things don't get confusing. You do hamd, right? Hamd stems from your heart, of course. But it's only done and professed with the tongue. Right? While shukr is something which can be done by the tongue and something that can also be professed through your actions and on your limbs. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, اِعْمَلُوا آلَ دَاوُودَ shukra. Do, O family of Dawood, perform actions, perform good deeds, shukra, out of gratefulness and thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say shukr, this can refer to a, a statement that's said on the tongue, but also it can refer to the actions that you do. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with a family, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with wealth, using that wealth, using those resources, resources which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, using them in the right way in things which are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's a form of shukr. That's a form of showing gratefulness and gratitude and thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they say that alhamd can only be done by the tongue while shukr can be done by the tongue and can also be done by one's actions. And likewise, alhamd is something which is done when we, when we make hamd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we make, say alhamdulillah, we are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for two possible things. Number one, for who he is subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you say alhamdulillah, it doesn't have to only be when you get that new job or when you, get, you find some money in your pocket or when, you know, you graduate or whatever it may be, right? Hamd, you do hamd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. In his essence, in his perfect names and attributes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving of our hamd, deserving of our praise. And hamd can also be done, of course, for something that you've been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is done first and foremost for who he is. That he is al-ghafoor, that he is al-rahim, that he is al-aziz, that he has these perfect names, uh, uh, that he has these beautiful names and perfect attributes. For who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in his kamal, in his jalal, in his perfection. So we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for who he is in his essence. And likewise, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what he's given us and what he continues to give us and what he's bestowed upon us from his favors and from his blessings. While shukr, another difference is that shukr is done, right, between human beings for the things that we do for one another, right? We thank one another, we're grateful to one another, right? But you don't um, do shukr of someone for who they are. Right? You don't make shukr of someone for how they look or how their character is. Right? You may praise someone, right? but you don't do shukr of a person for who they are or how, um, how they are in their behavior and, and how they look. Another thing to talk about which is important when it comes to hamd, brothers and sisters, respected elders, is that our hamd, our praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be rooted in two things. When we say Alhamdulillah, when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether for who He is in His essence or for what He's done for us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, our praise should be rooted in two things. Number one, Al-Mahabba, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're praising Him and our praise is rooted in our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two, at ta'zim glorifying and venerating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At-ta'zim. These two things are the root of our hamd, our praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if not, if these two things are not found, then in Arabic this is not called hamd anymore. 
if there isn't mahabba, if there isn't love from the person praising for the one being praised, and there isn't ta'zim from the praising person for the one being praised, then this is called madh. In Arabic, this is refer- referred to as madh. And this is what people do all the time nowadays. Right? You see a person comes, you know, maybe at the, uh, he, has a, he has a meeting at work or whatever, and he starts to speak about his boss, and, you know, boss has been great, you know, this quarter or, 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 or this year, he's done this for us, you know, just want to give him a round of applause and stuff like that. Allahu A'lam, if that's coming from his heart. Allah knows best how he truly feels about his boss. But he does it, why? For some benefit, for some gain, right? If he speaks about his boss in that manner in front of everybody, Allahu A'lam, next month he might get a promotion, right? And this is what used to be done for kings and queens, right? Poets would be brought in front of the masses to praise and to, you know, sing poetry and to say all of these words about the king and the queen. But in reality, this poet does not really care about the king or the queen. They just need to get paid, right? They have a job to do. So this, these words that they're saying about this king or this queen, this is not called hamd. Why? Because what they're saying isn't rooted in love. They just need some cash money. They just need to eat. They're trying to take care of their family. Right? So this is, can never be called hamd. It can be referred to as madh, which also can be translated in English to mean praise. And as you can tell now, with the English translations, it's going to make things very difficult to understand. Right? So it's better to just focus in Arabic and to keep the words in Arabic in the Arabic language. So this is very important, brothers and sisters. It's very important for us to understand and reflect over the fact that our praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be rooted in our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our ta'zim of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our glorification and veneration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for who he is subhanahu wa ta'ala and his great ability and his great might and for the things that he's given us in our life, whether it's our family, whether it's our kids, whether it's our spouses, whether it's our jobs, whether it's the peace and security that we enjoy, whatever it may be, right? Our praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to come from our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it can't just be something that we do for the sake of doing. You have to really feel it, right? That your praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is because of your love of him and for your ta'zim of him. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-azim, the great one. So where were we? Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So we said when we say alhamdulillah, we're saying that all praise, all perfect praise is deserving only to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Now we have the word rabb. And Rabb in Arabic, as we said, is translated to mean Lord, right? But this word Rabb can mean Lord in Arabic, it can mean Master, it can mean Owner, it can mean Malik, right? And we see even in the Qur'an that the word Rabb is used to refer to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word Rabb itself in the Arabic language is not specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the word Rabb by itself. But when you add the alif lam and you say ar-rabb, that's only referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you could say rabbul bayt. Rabbul bayt means the owner of the house. And Yusuf alayhi salam, what did he say to the two companions that he had with him? Amma ahadukuma fayasqi rabbahu khamra. When he was interpreting the dreams for them, he said, as for one of the two, one of you, one of you he says, فَيَسْقِي رَبَّهُ خمرا. I see that this person will give his rub wine to drink. And of course here, this word rub is not referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It means his master. That he will give khamr to drink, to his, he'll give it to his rub, his master. Right? His sayyid. But here when we see in this ayah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, this is of course referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Rabb. And when you hear the word Rabb, a few things should come to mind. 
When you hear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabbil Alameen, a few things should come to mind. Number one, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al Khaliq. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Creator. Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in am humul khaliqun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, were they created from nothing or did they themselves create themselves? So when you hear the word Rabb, you should remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Khaliq. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Malik. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Raziq, the one who provides for his creation, Muslim and non-Muslim, human being and animal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who provides for everything. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in Surah Al-Dhariyat that He is the one who has created jinn and mankind لِيَعْبُدُونِي to worship me. مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ I'm not asking them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for any provision. وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ And I'm not asking them to feed me. وَهُوَ يُطْعِمُ وَلَا يُطْعَمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who feeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not fed. In, and then Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ That الرَّزَّاق, which is سِيغَ مُبَالَغَ, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who provides for everyone and everything. Whether, you're a human, uh, whether it's a human being, whether it's a Muslim, whether it's a non-Muslim, a believer in Allah, a disbeliever in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an animal, a snail, a bird, everything is provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you hear the word Rabb, you should also remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a raziq the one who provides the one who gives sustenance. And also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-mudabbir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one in control of all of the affairs of the dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is in control of everything that happens. Inna kulla shay'in khalaqanahu biqadar. Everything has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That nothing happens. Nothing moves. Nothing changes except by the permission and will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That there is no change, there is no movement, except by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission. So all of these meanings should come to mind, inshaAllah, when we hear the word Rabb. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a Rabb. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Al Alameen. Al-Alameen, the ulama, they say, Kullu ma siwa Allah. That everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Alameen. Right? And it's important to understand, and inshallah, not to make this mistake when you're reciting, to recite it as, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. With a fatha on the lamb. Al-Alameen. And not Al-Alameen. Because that changes the meaning. Al-alimin are those who have knowledge, those, are, those who are scholars. وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, tells us in Surah Al-Ankabut that these are the parables that we strike for the people but the only ones who understand them, the only ones who benefit from them are those possessors of knowledge. So when we recite this ayah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Al Alameen. And Al Alameen is everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah, before we continue, like I said last week, you know, when I, when I speak uh, in front of people, I like to make the lesson or the session or whatever it is interactive. Right? I don't want you just to sit there and say, Naam, 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 ya shaykh, naam, naam, sah, sah. So inshallah, we'll take an intermission now. I want you guys, inshallah, to share some words 
about some reflections you have about these two verses that we've spoken about from Surah Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. What, what hits you now that you reflect over these verses and over the meanings of these verses? And don't worry, we're in a learning session now. So there's no right and wrong. Even if you say something that might not be correct, it's fine to say things in learning sessions, right? No one's giving fatwa. No one's standing on the minbar. So don't worry about it, inshallah. Uh, you know, I want you guys, inshallah, to participate. I want some people to uh, share some things uh, about what we've spoken about. Don't be shy, guys. Sheikh. Very good point by the Sheikh. He mentioned that um, when you hear the word Rabb, right, this also tells us and you know, gives us the understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who helps us move from one state to another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He cultivates us. And He is there for us from you know, when we're babies all the way to the point in which we return to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And throughout that time, as we mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's providing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's in control of the affairs of the slave. Sakallahu khairan. Come on, guys. Please. Hey, Sheikh. It doesn't have to be something else that we haven't mentioned. It could just be something that hits you. You know, as we were speaking about these different things and these different meanings. Shaykhna. Hmm. khair. Very good point. How much we hear, you know, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, right? Just in the three verses of reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, you say, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim again, right? So we're constantly reminded of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that our creator, the one we're worshiping, the one who we're trying to get close to is the most merciful. So if we ever fall short, if we ever, you know, uh, make mistakes, we're constantly reminded of this fact and that'll help us, you know, to never ever lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, very good point. Sheikh. طيب. طيب. Very good question. So he's saying, um, can you explain um, Ar-Rahim a bit more and, uh, and the fact that you said, or that I said, that Rahim refers to Allah's mercy you know, upon his creation. So like I said, um, there's many things, you know, there's uh, books and, and, and pages ex- uh, which have been written explaining the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. But to keep it simple, one of the explanations is that Ar-Rahman... This name refers to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the attribute of mercy. And that the name Ar-Rahim refers to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy reaches and touches His creation. Right? All of His creation, uh, you know, everything that is in existence um, uh, is touched by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is just one of the ways that the scholars explain the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. So meaning when you hear Ar-Rahman, you're thinking of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the attribute of mercy. And that when you think of Ar-Rahim or when you hear Ar-Rahim, you think about how that mercy applies to us and how 
you know, it applies to us in our daily lives or as Muslims, as human beings, as creation, as animals, nature, the world, the things around us. Uh, and Allah knows best. Sheikh. Mm-hmm. No, no. Yeah, so this is another way um, some scholars have described the difference between Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim, and that is that both of them have to do with Allah's mercy uh, being connected to His creation. Right? This is another explanation, which is that Ar Rahman refers to Allah's mercy upon everyone and everything. Muslim, non-Muslim, believer, disbeliever, right? Everything in creation. Ar-Rahman refers to Allah's mercy, you know, uh, descending upon everything. While Ar-Rahim refers to a special mercy, a specific mercy, which is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's believing slaves. And they quote the ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا Right? إِنَّهُ بِهِمْ Rahim, right? Which is a verse regarding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But they say that that uh, Ar Rahman refers to the mercy which uh, descends upon all of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and Ar Rahim specifically the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa taala upon His believing slaves. طيب. Should we continue? Hmm. MashaAllah, very good point. Uh, the Shaykh mentioned that uh, one thing that comes to mind uh, is when you say Rabbil Alameen, um, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the great power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the dire need His creation has for Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the need that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation has for Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nasu, antum al fuqara'u ila Allah. Wallahu. That Allah says in Surah Al-Fatir, O people, O mankind, antum al-fuqara. This doesn't mean that you're broke. Fuqara here doesn't mean that, you know, it's hard times. No, fuqara, faqir in the Arabic language, the, the, the base meaning of faqir means al-muhtaj, the, mon- the one who's in need. And of course, someone who doesn't have money in their pockets is, is, is in need. But here in this verse, Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, antum al fuqara, you are the ones who are in need, in dire need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Wallahu huwa al ghaniyul hamid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self sufficient and is all praiseworthy. Whether we praise Him or whether we don't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hamid. Right? He is always praiseworthy. What time is it? Uh, طيب, uh, maybe we'll just mention a couple more things about the next verse. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. We spoke about these two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now, just to highlight um, the importance, like I, like I said, of a Muslim and a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly remembering these names. Constantly remembering that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran al kareem in several, in several verses, that the only ones who despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who disbelieve. And those who have gone astray. قَالَ وَمَنْ يَقْنَطُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّهِ إِلَّا الضَّالُّونَ that the only ones who despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who have gone astray. So as long as you're a Muslim, as long as you're a believer, you have to always have hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ya'qub alayhi salam, when he told his sons to go, he told them, وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ 
Don't despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُ مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ That the only ones who despair, who give up in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the kafirun, those who don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who have disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So as long as you're a believer, as long as you're a Muslim, you have to constantly remember these two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Hijr, speaking to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, نَبِّئْ عِبَادِي أَنِّي أَنَا الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He says, inform my slaves. Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell my slaves about me. What should the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell us about you, Ya Allah? Anni ana al rahim That I am the most forgiving, the most merciful. But also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to say, wa anna adabi huwa al-adhabu al-aleem. And they should also be informed, they should also know that my punishment is the most severe punishment. Right? But here, as you, as you see once again, what was mentioned first? The punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ لِمَمَّا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ قُلْ لِلَّهِ كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote upon himself, he ordained upon himself. No one can force Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do anything. No one can pressure wal'iyadh billah or push Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do anything. But from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy towards us, kataba ala nafsihi rahmah He has written, he has ordained upon himself, decreed upon himself, ar-rahma mercy. Mercy. Right? So when we read Surah Al-Fatiha every single time, it's as if when we recite Surah Al-Fatiha, we should have more hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should remember the vast mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every time, think about it. Every time when you pray, in every rak'ah of every prayer, imagine if you bring this to mind. Imagine if you bring this to mind, the fact that I'm worshipping and I'm reciting this Qur'an which was revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my creator, the most gracious, the most merciful. I just made a mistake. I just did something I shouldn't have done before coming to the masjid. I just did something at school, at work, whatever it may be, wherever it may be. I should have never done that. But when I recite, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I constantly remember that, hey, wait, wait a minute. Shaitan almost had me in the corner. Shaitan almost had me. Right? It was the 12th round. I was about to get knocked out. But I remember now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the most gracious, the most merciful. That's my Lord. And you can use this as a weapon against shaitan. Because shaitan is going to come and tell you, you did that yesterday, what's the point of doing this today? Whenever you try to do something good, shaitan is going to come and tell you, you've done so many bad things in your life. You lived a life in which you didn't pray for so many years. You didn't give zakat. You didn't give sadaqah. You didn't open the Quran. Your Quran is, is covered with dust. But you tell shaitan, wait a minute. Hold up, buddy. You stay in that corner, you're rajim. You're far away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But me, I can be close to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna rahmatullahi qareebun min al muhsinin. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is close to the doers of good. Shaitan is ar rajim the accursed. al marjum he's far away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of how he reacted to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kibr that he showed before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But us as believers, inshallah, we can be from the muhsineen who are close to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to them. So inshallah, I want to stop here. As I said last week, I don't want to draw, draw out these uh, lectures. Inshallah, I want to keep them short and concise. And obviously, I want you guys to come back every week. <laughs> so we'll stop here, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us from the knowledge that we learn. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman innaka anta al-alimul hakim. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our hearts, um, to make the Qur'an the spring of our hearts. Allahumma ja'ala al-Qur'an al-azim rabi'a qulubina wa nura sudurina wa jala'a ahzanina wa dhahaba humumina wa ghumumina. 
اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وجزاكم الله خيرا I really appreciate you know, your attentiveness and respect as I'm speaking If anyone has any questions on the topic Any questions on the topic Anything I said, anything maybe you might not have understood uh, completely Inshallah the floor is open to ask those questions As for fatwas and all of those other things Inshallah You can go on Google and YouTube <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking but Inshallah if you have any questions on topic we can, we can answer them bi uh, and we'll stop there. I'll see you guys next week, inshallah.